want you to think if you've ever had a difficult moment in a relationship and the emotion felt like a filter after a while. Raise your hand if you have ever felt like you were talking but they weren't listening to your words. <laughs> yes, unbelievably frustrating. And sometimes that happens with ourselves. We have a strong emotion, a, a fear or an offense. You get offended, and for the first couple days, it's fun because you get to be right about why they're wrong. But after a while, you just want your life back. You don't care anymore. Today, we're going to look at new possibilities with difficult emotions. And I want to show you what's running the show, how emotions get created. We're going to look at how your brain takes music and language and turns it into a rich emotional experience. And by looking at that, you'll have access to something new that will allow you to actually reach inside somebody else and shift their emotional state. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a spouse or a boss that was upset with you, but that's kind of a handy thing to be able to do. <laughs> We're going to take a look at that. But if you're writing notes down, this whole talk is predicated on one thing, and that is the importance of remembering what you want at all times. Now, since we'll be talking about music and language for the next few minutes, would it be okay if I shared a little bit about myself? My name is Jared Hanning. I'm the principal violist with the South Carolina Philharmonic, and I work as a performance coach where I train leaders in the thinking patterns of success. What some people don't know about music is that when you're engaged in music, whether you're clapping your hands at a concert or singing in the shower, shouting out to the radio, driving down the road, in that moment that you are creating music, you are using more of your brain than any other time. This is well documented with MRI studies, and this contrasts with other endeavors, like, say, athletic performance, where the better your body is performing, the less of your brain you're using. Your brain almost enters a meditative state because it's soaking up precious resources that need to go to the muscles. This is important because a breakthrough in your situation, that difficult emotion or that difficult relationship, a breakthrough will first happen as a breakthrough in your thinking. So being able to access different ways of thinking, different parts of your brain on demand, is kind of a handy thing. All right, you ready? Turn to your neighbor and say, get ready. Get this is a single note. Notice that you don't care. <laughs> right? One note, it has no effect on you. But that note has definition. The note has pitch. You can tell if it's a high note or a low note. It has color. You can tell what kind of an instrument made it. It has length. We know how long it was. We know how loud it was. But all of those definitions have no effect on you. But when we have two notes, it kicks off an interesting process in your brain. What you do with that note is you compare it to a note that you recently heard. Because after you hear a note, it no longer exists, except in your memory. And your memory of that note is as unique as you are. You're effectively comparing what you heard with something you created. But at the same time, you are also making a prediction of the note that you think is coming next. But because this note lives in the future, it is also as unique as you are. What do you think is coming next? Now, all three of these things happen at the same time, which creates the illusion that they are the same thing. Because the note that you heard showed up at the same time that you felt the emotion, it creates the illusion that what you heard caused the emotion. But actually, there's something sandwiched in between there that is yet more powerful. As a result of making this comparison, your brain is able to construct a meaning. What I want you to know is that without this hidden meaning, there can be no emotional response. Wherever there is an emotional response, there is a meaning hiding that's driving it. Let's take a look at how that works in language. Jane is a very successful woman. She's walking to work one day. And she has two college kids pass her. 
They turn around and they say, well, Jane, I see you didn't have any trouble getting all 200 pounds dressed for work today. And Jane was deeply wounded. She was in tears for three days. But because all three of those things happened at the same time, the word that she heard, comparing it to something she remembered, making a prediction of what she thinks is coming next, it creates the illusion that those words caused how she felt. But we know now that it doesn't. Without the hidden meaning, there can be no emotional response. And this all comes down to one thing, remembering what you really want. Now, what did Jane hear that day? 200 pounds. What's the definition of 200 pounds? 3,200 ounces. Was 3,200 ounces the cause of her suffering that day? No. We've got to find out what was driving it. Now, I don't know if you, maybe as a kid, put an object on a piece of paper and then covered it with another piece of paper, and then after you cover it, you can kind of sketch on it with a pencil. And as you sketch on it with a pencil, it causes whatever's underneath, a paper clip or a coin or a leaf, it causes it to bleed through. This principle is important because it does not matter what you do to the top sheet of paper. As long as something's underneath it, it's going to bleed through. You might have found yourself trying to cheer up somebody who was in a foul mood and notice that the more you try to positively cheer them up, the grumpier they get, the more they push back. And that's because this tablet of meaning is inside your head and no one has access to it but you. Whatever shows up there shows up in your own handwriting. The more you try to write your meaning on top of somebody else's tablet, the more theirs bleeds through until you address the meaning. Because when the hidden meaning is revealed, a new possibility becomes present. But this isn't possible if you forget what you want. See, if you forget what you want, you want to argue about what was said which only keeps the emotion in place. But they said this. Oh, I'm sorry they said that. Oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. I would feel the same way too. But they said this. But th Until we address this, it's going to stay in place. As a matter of fact, the more you talk about what was said, the stronger the agreement becomes that you should feel that way. But if you want to be free, this is what you do. Jane, what did it mean to you? And Jane says, it means my mother was right. It means I can't follow through with my goals. It means I give up too soon. It means I'm a quitter. It means I'm not a very good wife. It means I'm not attractive. It means I don't deserve to be loved. Where did that come from? The boy, the pastor, only gave her a measurement, a definition. We are not moved by definition. We are moved by meaning. Where did this come from? <coughs> Who created this? And this is the nature of being offended. Blaming somebody else for something that we created. You see, even if they tell you specifically what they want it to mean, it cannot show up on that tablet unless you write it down. Because it's in your head and only you have access to it. The only thing that shows up there is in your handwriting. Now, to break the cycle, remember what you want. Now, hearing this story, you might say, well, come on. What else was she supposed to do? I mean, I would be offended, too. Okay, let me ask you. Let's say that uh, it was a guy who weighed 180 pounds, and his dream was to be 200. Thought he'd be more of a guy, be more respected. So he starts working out. Actually, he just started working out that day. And the kid passes him and says, well, I see you didn't have any trouble getting all 200 pounds dressed for work today. The working out's paying off. <laughs> yeah, that's right. What if it was somebody who weighed 220 pounds and they didn't like that, they wanted to reduce their weight. So they decide that day they're gonna change their eating patterns. They eat their first salad that day. They get passed by the youth. I see you didn't have any trouble getting all 200 pounds dressed today. A pretty good salad. 
paying off already. <laughs> what if it was somebody from the Mauritania tribe of Africa? You see, in this tribe, being overweight is prized because it's seen as a symbol of wealth. It is such a status symbol that families will send their daughters to force-feeding camps to forcefully fatten them up to make them more attractive to a wealthy suitor who will think that their family has access to more food than they know what to do with. What if it was that person walking down the street? You see, the meaning is as unique as you are. And blaming them for what they said is like being mad at somebody for agreeing with you. But if you reach the point that you want to be free, you don't want to be right, remember what you want. I was taking audition for the symphony, and the chair that was open at that time was the assistant principal. So I go to work preparing for that audition. I practiced five hours a day for six months straight to get ready for 10 minutes with the committee. I play my audition, the personnel manager comes to me afterwards and says, the committee doesn't feel that you're good enough. Now many times in life, they say no, and we go to work creating a story, I'm not good enough. Many times in life, they say, not this time. And so we make up a story, I'm not good enough. In this case, the committee actually said that. But remember, nothing shows up on your tablet unless you write it there. So I had the opportunity to choose. Was I going to spend the next five days in suffering and mourning and tears and wailing and sell my instrument and leave the business, or was I going to get that chair? Remembering what you want breaks the cycle. So rather than creating an unnecessary meaning, I just went back to practicing because they were going to listen to me until I got that chair. I have a son, and uh, if you have created a child, you know it brings with it a mama bear and a papa bear. And this is like a new entity that takes over your body and causes you to think differently. Well, being self-employed at the time, my insurance was self-employed, and so it made more sense that juniors should be on mama's policy because she had a big, fancy hospital policy where she worked. And then I get to thinking, well, you know what? I should probably have a copy of that card. What if something happens to junior while he's with me and mama's at work or mama's asleep? I should have a copy of the card so I can help. Can I get a copy of that card? Yeah, yeah, we'll get you one, we'll get you one. A couple weeks go by, can I get a copy of that card? Oh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get it to you. Few more weeks go by. Can I get it? Now you see where this is going, right? So I'm getting more upset because something's standing in the way of me being more involved with my son. She's getting more upset because Mama Bear kicks in. Mama Bear's job is to protect the little one against everyone on the planet. <laughs> Some women feel this stronger than others. So this goes on for three months. It's getting worse and worse and worse. Finally, we're going to have the talk. Now, I could go into the talk and do this the old-fashioned way. I'm sure you know how well that works. Or I could, so remembering what I wanted. Do I want the card? No. I want to be involved in my son's life, and I want a fantastic relationship with his mother. Remember what you want, it breaks the cycle. Definitions do not move us, meaning does. So I open up the conversation. I would imagine, if you gave me a copy of that card, you might feel like you weren't needed anymore. I would imagine if you gave me a copy of that card, you might feel like you weren't a very good mother because you had opened it up for somebody else to help. I got halfway through my third, I would imagine, and she just handed me the card. Because when you move the hidden meaning, a new possibility is created. I had a boss that whenever I would ask her a question, she would off with his head. So, hey, what time is the March concert? Wow, why do you keep asking me that? Hey, I was wondering what we're going to do for the April. So I just quit asking her questions. Well, we have a meeting. We sit down for the meeting. And um, up in the meeting comes, in my employee review, Jared, the problem with you is you don't ask me enough questions. <laughs> and I'm thinking, funny, you should say that. Now, I can do this the old-fashioned way, you know how well that works, or I can create a new possibility. 
So remembering what I want, which is a great relationship with my boss, I say, just because I ask you doesn't mean you didn't tell me. It just means I don't know for whatever reason. Oh, really? Well, I'd love to help you. When you remove the hidden meaning, a new possibility emerges. So this is what I offer to you. Should you find yourself on the hook, remember what you want. Should you find yourself offended or hurt or angry, and you're tired of that emotion taking over your sleep and your day, remember what you want. If they tell you no, if they tell you you're not ready, if they tell you you can't, if they tell you you're not good enough, remember what you want. Because when you remember what you want, it breaks the cycle 